Well, what do cuttlefish and clams, snails and slugs all have in common? They are mollusks, one of the most fascinating groups of animals in the world. Today, we're going to learn more about these amazing animals with Dr. Tim Pierce from the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. Tim studies snails, and he tells jokes about them too. Why do snails usually lose arguments? Because they don't have a leg to stand on. Hello and welcome. I see we have Noah and, and Harvey watching from Canada. Hello to CM in Virginia, to Amy from Vermont, and Rachel and Kid Sobel. We are excited to have you here today. And Tim, I'm so glad that you can join us. Let's start by, can you tell us how you became a scientist? How did you get into studying snails? Uh, well, I've loved nature my whole life. And I think I have an extra collecting gene. I love to collect things, but I don't like to kill things. And you know, a butterfly collection would be really pretty, but you have to kill the butterflies to get the wings off. So if you find an empty snail shell, you can collect it and not have to kill anything. So I think that that's why I like snails in particular, but all, most of my life I've actually loved all of nature and I would collect and study all of it. And then when I got to college, my second year in college, I had to do a term project and I did it on slugs and that really got me hooked on snails. So that's how I focused on snails. And you went to graduate school to study snails, right? That's right, yes. So what, what, tell us just a tiny bit about your research. What type of snails did you research when you were in graduate school? Well, for my master's de degree, I was studying snail paleontology. I was working on an island off the coast of California, studying the fossil land snails that were barely dead. The other people in, my, in the paleontology department said, Tim, your, your snails are barely dead. They were only one eighth of a million years old, the oldest one. <laughs> Um, so that, I mean, I think that's pretty old, but they were studying things that were hundreds of millions of years old. So I was studying these, uh, the evolution of these snails on the island. And then for my PhD, I went to the University of Michigan and I studied, um, why do snails grow more slowly when they're crowded? So it was a snail ecology question. And, uh, that was a lot of fun too. Neat. So let's start off, let's start off with talking just a little bit about mollusks because that's our, our theme that we're looking at this month for just the science mom crowd. And mollusks are incredible animals. So what, what makes a snail a mollusk? What is a mollusk? <laughs> Excellent question. Do you have those slides? I do. Um, yeah. So first I wanna talk about how do the snails fit in with all of the other creatures in the world, all of the other animals in the world. So we're gonna divide all of the animals in the world. There's somewhere between 2 million and 30 million different species of animals in the world. We haven't finished counting. And we're gonna divide those up into major groups called phyla or phylum for singular. You can see it on this slide. And there are about 35 to 40 different phyla in the world. And the arthropods is the largest one. That's the blue part of that pie chart. But the mollusks is the second largest phylum. Yay, mollusks. And Yay. The, the chordates like us, the yellow bar there, that's the third largest phylum of, of, uh, in the world. And so there are more kinds of mollusks than there are vertebrates. That's pretty amazing, I think. So yeah, the mollusks are the second largest phylum in the world. So they are a force to be reckoned with. And in the next slide, you can see the different kinds of mollusks. Do you have the next slide? Yeah, there it is. So just look underneath this yellow bar here. The um, uh, There are eight classes of mollusks and you have heard of at least three of them. I'm sure you've heard of three of them. You might even have eaten some mollusks. Um, and so the, the gastropods, those are the snails. They're, they're, it's, the French people love to eat, eat gastropods. Um, they call them escargot. And escargot is the French word for snails. If you can say escargot, you can speak French. Um, and the joke would be, you can buy escargot at the French restaurant, but they don't sell escargot at McDonald's because McDonald's serves fast food. Ah. <laughs> Nails are slow. Um, so another group, another class of mollusks that you've heard of and maybe eaten are the clams. So clams have two shells. They um, are called bivalves. 
because by means to and valve means show. And then the third class that you have heard of are the cephalopods. That includes the octopus and the squids. And um, so you might even have eaten those too. Most people have never even heard of the other classes of mollusks, let alone eaten them, but they are out there too. They're important. Well, let's, let's talk about those main three ones. First, cephalopods. Cephalopods are incredible animals. So we have nautiluses, squids, and octopuses. Why, why do these animals have three hearts? Can you tell us a little bit about their physiology? Um, actually, I don't know if they all have three hearts, but octopus do. I think squids do too. Um, so they've got one heart there that's mainly for pumping the blood around the body. But then they've also got a heart underneath each gill. So it's pumping blood through the gills. Um, octopuses, I guess, are such active animals that um, they really need to be able to get a lot of oxygen. Ox um, mollus all mollusks have um, copper-based blood. So you know that we have iron-based blood. The iron is what helps the hemoglobin to carry the oxygen around our bodies. But in, in uh, mollusks, most of them have copper-based blood, it's called hemocyanin, and it's not quite as efficient for carrying uh, oxygen as hemoglobin is. Um, so I think that maybe that's why the um, octopuses most have to, they have to have extra hearts to help pump their blood through their gills so that they can get enough oxygen to be as active as those, um, you know, fishes, things that have hemoglobin. And what, what makes these things all be in the same family do they have anything in common <laughs> right you might say you might yeah excellent question what is it that makes all of these things they're so different why would yeah. anybody put all of these things in the same phylum and so you know some people think oh it must be the shell that makes a mollusk a mollusk but the octopus doesn't have a shell and some sea slugs they don't have a shell so it's not the shell um it's a bunch of different characters but I'm gonna talk about the radula. The radula is a feeding structure in the mouth. It's kind of like a flexible file or a, a ribbon of teeth, you could think of it. And so the, the mollusk scrapes the radula over the food and it breaks off chunks of food into the mouth. So the important point is, if you're holding something that has a radula in, in its mouth, you're definitely holding a mollusk because the radula is unique to mollusks. Um, but it's not, um, it's not perfect because there are some mollusks that don't have a radula. For example, uh, bivalves, the clams, they don't have a radula. And if you think about it, the radula is in the mouth, the mouth is in the head, and clams don't really have a proper head. So <laughs> not really. probably why they don't have a, um, a radula. So we consider that to be an evolutionary loss. Um, just like if you think about snake legs, and you're looking at me like, what are you talking about, snake legs? Um, but actually, the ancestor of the snakes did have legs, and then they got smaller and smaller and smaller. And then, actually, the boas and the pythons still have the femur. So they, they still do. have the, the femur, of, uh, which, which is evidence that at one time their ancestors had legs. They don't have any front legs. And all of the other snakes don't have any uh, evidence at all of the limb. But the boas and the pythons do have that femur. Now you said that you hmm? oh you said that you have a collecting gene, so I think it's rather perfect that now you work organizing the collection of the Carnegie Natural History Museum. So do you have any specimens that you could show us of us uh, that are cephalopods? Any examples? Um, well, here is a here's an example of a chambered nautilus. So a nautilus is actually a type of cephalopod, and in life it would have it would have about um, 80 to 120 tentacles sticking out there. <clears throat> the um, Nautilus is not known for being particularly smart. Oh, and it's called the chambered Nautilus because if you were to cut it, you would be able to see all these chambers in there. So these chambers are, so here's, here's the normal, the outside. And this one's been sectioned so you can see the chamber. And you can see a little um, notch there. So that's actually where there used to be a tube going through and the tube allows the animal to pump gas in and out of the chambers so that it can regulate its buoyancy, go up and down. And so uh, I'm not quite sure how they do that, but um, they do, they pump gas in and out. And um, one thing to notice about this particular specimen is the last chamber 
just before it reaches sexual maturity, the last chamber is smaller than the rest. So all of them are basically the same size, but then the last chamber here is smaller than the rest. So this animal died when it was sexually mature. Wow, that's a beautiful shell. And we have a, a good question that came in from CM. Is a snail's blood a different color than a human's blood because it has copper instead of iron? Right. So you've heard about those tr those blue bloods. The, the snails, their blood, when it's unoxygenated, it's blue. When it's oxygenated, it's clear. Where our blood, when it's oxygenated, it's red. And when it's unoxygenated, it's blue. So the snails and the mollusks, they are the blue bloods of the world. So they, they really do have blue blood. That is pretty cool. Yes. And what about clams? Let's talk just a little bit about clams. Can you tell us maybe a little bit about just how they live and what they eat? Um, well, so most of the mollusks that we've talked about are live in the ocean. Snails live in the freshwater and on the land. Clams can live in the ocean and freshwater, but not on the land. And sometimes people ask, well, why are there no clams on the land? Well, it's because most clams are actually um, filter feeders or suspension feeders. Here's an example of a giant clam. And so it would be bringing in water and then passing it over its gills. And then it has little cilia, little tiny hairs on its gills that would sort out the food from the inedible parts and send the food down to the mouth. And uh, that's how they get their food. Um, so they're, they're getting food out of the suspended material. And if you think about what, what it's like on land, there's not really a lot of things floating around in the, in the air. I mean, spiders do it. Spiders are basically filtering food out of the air, but there's not quite enough. I don't think there's quite enough for, to, for a, a clam to survive on dry land. So that's no, probably why there are no land clams. Land clams. But in the water, when they're in the water, they really are cleaning the water then. If they're filtering out all the little particles, they can clean water, right? They do, yes. And so um, in some of our fresh, in some of our rivers and lakes, we have freshwater clams living there. And yeah, they're pumping, oh, I don't know, quarts or liters per day. Um, so they, they do a very good job of cleaning the water. So we need to be grateful for, we call it, Scientists call that ecosystem services. So these are mm. services that the ecosystem is doing for us without us having to pay for it. And so we should be grateful to the clams for doing these ecosystem services, cleaning our water for us. And what are some of the biggest clams, biggest and smallest? I'm seeing several questions in the chat about a, what's the biggest clam? The biggest clam. Okay, so this species is the biggest clam. This is um, an example of the giant clam. Um, Tridacna gigas is the scientific name. And they live in the uh, Pacific Ocean and the, the South Pacific and the Indian Ocean. They do not live in the South Atlantic Ocean. I'm not quite sure why, um, but that's the biggest clam. They can get almost two meters in diameter. Two meters, two meters across? So definitely bigger than one meter. So that would be a yard, um, almost two yards for those of you who speak English. Um, <sighs> And one of the cool things about giant clams is, in addition to filter feeding or, su or suspension feeding, they also have algae living inside their bodies. So in the daytime, the clam opens up and then the algae um, receives light from the sun. And then the algae can um, grow and make food for the clam. And then the clam gives the algae a safe place to live. So they live together in that symbiosis, we call it. Symbiosis means living together. They live together as happy as an algae. <laughs> no, happy as a clam. <laughs> but I think that's why they can get so big because they're solar collectors. They're getting their energy straight from the sunlight. Yeah. So it's like they've got their own solar panel system set up. Yeah. I that that size is amazing to me. I mean, that's big enough that the clam could close on a person and trap them inside, being that up to two well, meters in diameter, right? Right. So I was under the impression that that only happens in the movies. Um, you know, you can try and stick your foot into a giant clam and it just moves so slowly you would never get caught. But somebody recently told me that, in fact, it does happen in real life. So I don't know who to believe, but, uh, you know, don't try it. because <laughs> Don't, don't try get... it. If you're, if you're scuba diving and you see a giant clam, don't swim inside it. <laughs> what about the smallest clam? Right. The smallest clam um, would be so small you wouldn't be able to see it. It's about two, two millimeters in diameter. and 
There are tiny, tiny clams that live in the ocean. There are actually tiny clams that live in fresh water. And in fact, the clam that has the record for the highest mollusk, they can live up in, in lakes in the Himalayas. Um, that is one of the tiniest clams. They're in the, in the freshwater clam family, Spheriidae, the, uh, the pill clams or the pea clams. They're, they can be awfully tiny. And I suspect that they get up there riding on the feet of ducks or the feet of other water birds. Oh, wow. So they're tiny and they also have the record for the highest mollusk. The highest mollusk living up in the Himalayas. That's amazing. Where, um, where do snails live? Because we're going to, so we, we talked about cephalopods a little bit and we talked about clams, but I wanted to make sure we could talk the most about snails because I know that's your specialty. So tell us a little bit about snails. What makes a snail a snail and where do they live? Well, so you asked about where they live. They live in the ocean, in the freshwater, and on the land. So they basically live everywhere. Although they don't yet live on, the land snails don't live on Antarctica yet. But, you know, we've got climate change and global warming. So I think in the future, we might have snails on Antarctica. I actually did go to, what's the name of that island? The, the south, south, southernmost part of South America. Oh, Tierra del Fuego. Oh. Tierra del Fuego. I went there and I actually found land snails living on Tierra del Fuego. So that's not very far away from Antarctica. So, that's not, so anywhere people live, snails can live too, right? Well, not land snails in Antarctica, but, but pretty close. There are snails in, on the north slope of Alaska, land snails, but there are definitely sea snails in, in uh, Antarctica. So yeah, there are snails all over the world. And um, then you were asking me about what makes a snail a snail. Um, I'm going to use the word poop in my answer. Is that okay? Yeah, that's totally fine. All right. So most animals have their mouth in the front and their anus in the back, which it's a pretty good arrangement, I think. <coughs> and mollusks have that arrangement too. Their mouth in the front, their anus in the back. Um, but snails, um, well, actually snails, when they're really, really young, they might be you know, less than a week old. They're either still inside the egg or they're floating in the plankton. They've got their mouth in the front and their anus in the back. But then they twist around 180 degrees and it brings the anus over the head. So they- They, they poop out the top of their head? They poop, well, they poop out, um, yeah. Well, right, so this is called torsion. And that's something that all snails do. All snails undergo torsion and it ends up with their their anus over their head. So they are the real poop heads of the world. Um, <laughs> all snails do that. And so that's one way you can tell whether it's a snail or not. Wow. Whether they, whether they have torsion. Um, I thought for sure you were going to say that it was the shell, but I, now that I'm thinking about it, if they're going to eat things and digest it inside the shell and then get it back out, you know, it has to be coming back out in the front. That's true. That's true. Um, so actually, there are some other types of mollusks, like the monoplacophorans, um, which is a group most people have never heard of, that sometimes have coiled shells. Let's see, the fossil ones did. I'm not sure if any modern ones do, but they don't have torsion. So their, um, their anus would be in the back like most mollusks. Um, but no, the snails, they all, they all undergo that torsion. Some of them then would detort a little bit. So in fact, the anus is on the side of the head, um, but other ones still have it up in the front. And, and do all snails have shells or are there some snails that don't have shells? Um, so I'm going to include the slugs in with the snails. Um, they are, the slugs evolved, actually they evolved numerous times from snails, but the snails came first and then the slugs evolved from snails by reducing the size of the shell and then internalizing it. So their body grew over it. So many, many, actually most slugs do have an internal shell inside. Um, it's just reduced to a flat plate or sometimes a slight spiral, but most of them do have shell. Interesting. Um, we do have some that don't have any shell at all, but most of them have a shell. But most of them do. And how do they how do they get their shells? Are they born with them? They let's see. If they have a shell, they all form their shell within within the egg. Sorry. If they have an egg, they form their shell inside the egg and then hatch. And so I don't know if you'll be able to see it. Um, but anyway, this this part of the snail 
formed inside the shell, inside the egg. Oh, wow. And for, by the time it hatched, it had a shell, and then it just continued adding shell material onto it. So, you know, if this snail were still alive, he would add more shell along this edge and then continue that spiral. And so, yeah, it came out of the egg and it was really tiny, and then it just added shell and kept on growing that spiral. For, for the ones that live in the plankton, they will actually not have a shell yet when they first get up to the plankton. They'll be, um, they start out in the shape of a little top, you know, the, the top that you play with. Um, and then it'll grow into another animal that has these big lobes called a velum. And then they use that to swim around and also to collect food. And then they will metamorphose and start to grow a shell, a spiral shell. And then they will lose the velum and then uh, fall to the bottom and um, continue their shell. Oh, wow. So it sounds like sea snails have quite a bigger process, like more stages than land snails when, they, when they're developing. Well, I think, I think the land snails do those processes within the egg. Inside so the egg. You just don't see them. And then sea slugs, so the sea slug will go through that process, metamorphose into something with a shell, and then they lose the shell and metamorphose into a, a tiny slug with no shell whatsoever. And so then they crawl wow. in and be sea slugs. That's fascinating. Uh, the Atkins family wants to know if snails ever change shells or if the shell they have is the shell they're born with and they have it all the time. Excellent question. Um, so if you're thinking about changing shells, you're probably thinking of hermit crabs. Hermit crabs definitely need to change their shells. No, snails do not change their shells. They are attached to their shell, just like, just like your muscles are attached to your bones. You know, you can't switch skeletons. <laughs> So the snail is attached to its shell um, in there about one whole turnaround. So it might be attached somewhere in around here. And, um, and actually that attachment is what allows it to pull into its shell when it gets scared or if it needs to pull in. Mm -hmm. So it's attached to its shell. Um, so no, the snails do not change their shells. They are born with one shell. And actually what that does is it allows you to then see the whole snail's um, life. You can see evidence of what was happening through the snail's life. And some people, um, bio, or, um, chemists, chemists will sometimes take a snail shell and then they can grind off just a little bit of the calcium carbonate there and they can look at the isotopes of oxygen and then determine you know, things like the temperature of the water when the snail was a baby compared to when it was grown up. And they can tell things about the snail's life by looking at those things. That is really neat. A chemical isotope. Yeah. Val and Isa want to know how exactly does the snail add or grow more shell? Is it like gathering sand and then like sticking it on with its mouth? How does it do it? <laughs> well, that's a little bit more technical than um, even I know. I mean, here, let me ask you this. How do you grow your bones? You know, you don't know how you do it. You just do it. Um, but it has something to do. I'm sorry, what? Oh, go ahead. It has something to do with the shell, the snail's mantle. The mantle is the outer covering. You can think of it like the skin. It's the outer covering of the snail. And that's the part that secretes the shell. So the, the mantle, it starts out by producing um, a, a lattice of protein. So I don't know, it's not really a, a checkerboard, but it's, it's a crisscross of, of, um, of protein. And then the protein um, is the nucleus for depositing calcium carbonate crystals. And so they deposit, um, either out of the water directly or um, in the fluids that are around the mantle, um, like in land snails, the fluids around the mantle would have calcium carbonate, and then that deposits on the on the growing crystals, and then they, they grow there and become the shell. So different snails will have different layers of shells, uh, uh, different shell layers, rather. And so if you look at it with a, a microscope, you can see different types of layers, like there might be a prismatic layer, which is... Um, or a, a nacreous layer, which is mother of pearl and very shiny. And then there might be a prismatic layer that's uh, more structural and, and firm. And then this outer layer is actually protein and that's called the periostracum. So the snail has different shell layers and they have different properties to help with strength and with help with flexibility. And uh, it's, it's, they're pretty amazing. <laughs> that is amazing. And that sort of leads right into Hania's question. Hania asks, why do shells have grooves and patterns on them? Because sometimes a snail shell will be really beautiful with really detailed patterns. And in fact, the one you have now has some beautiful patterns. Um, 
Yeah, the why questions are the really hard ones to answer in science. Um, you might have talked about this before, but in science, we don't prove things to be true. We can only prove things to be false. Have we talked about that before? Yeah. Okay. So um, the why questions, you know, you can't say, well, I think it's because of such and such. And you can't go out and prove that. Instead, what you can do is you can say, let's see, here are all the possible reasons I can think of that they might have color patterns. And then you would go about falsifying them. Well, if they have it for finding mates, then you would say, well, if, they, if they're using it for finding mates, then such and such would have to be true. You know, the mates would have to respond to color patterns. And then if you do an experiment and say, hmm, well, no, they didn't respond to that. So that one is falsified. So they're not doing it for that mm -hmm. reason. And then you go through and all of your hypotheses, you set about trying to falsify them. And the one or two that you cannot falsify, those might be the answer. But it could also be something you haven't thought of yet. So yeah. scientists, for we don't know for sure why, or maybe we know for some species, but not for others? I think we probably don't know why. <clears throat> um, probably some of the most likely reasons for color patterns are likely to be camouflage or hiding. So, you know, most land snails, they're kind of drab, brown, and they're living in the leaf litter. So they're probably colored like the leaf litter or like the soil. So that's probably a good answer, but no, nobody really knows why. Don't there are some that are bright colors too. Um, so like this one might be stripy because who knows, maybe it's hiding in the grass, I don't know. We've got a great question from the Sobel family. They want to know, how is a left-handed whelk different from a right-handed one? Oh, nice question. Um, I didn't bring any examples here, but right. Almost all snails of the world are coiled right. We call them right-handed coiling. Or if you start at the beginning, they coil clockwise. So we call them right-handed. Or if you hold the beginning up and the aperture toward you, it's on the right side. So we call these right-handed snails. Um, every once in a while, you'll get a left-handed snail one that coils the other direction. And those are, generally, they're pretty scarce. They're one out of 10,000 or one out of 100,000. So they're much more scarce than left-handed humans. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and so, yeah, the shell collectors, they'll pay you big money for those left-handed shells. Except sometimes you get a whole species that coils left. And if the species coils left, um, then the whole species coils the other direction. And then, it's the right-handed ones of those species that are the rare ones. So in the whelks, um, the ones up where I live, and, um, you know, north of, uh, I guess, north of North Carolina, almost all of those coil right-handed. But if you get uh, to South Carolina and Florida, those areas, you'll get left-handed whelks. And, well, you'll get both of them in, in Florida, left and right-handed ones. But you'll get some species that coil almost all right, or left-handed, rather. Um, but every once in a while, you'll find a left-handed one of either the northern whelks or the left-handed ones. You'll find a, a right-handed one. And so those are unusual. They're definitely unusual. Interesting. I, that makes me want to start looking. The next time I see snails, I'm going to hold them up and say, do you coil right or left? And most of the time, it'll be right. That is really do, do interesting. Do we have time to get into embryology? M maybe just a little bit, yeah. Okay. Um, so... <clears throat> Um, I want you to remember back to when you were a fertilized egg, and then you divide it into two cells, then you divide it into four cells, and then, pay attention now, when you divide it into eight cells, for you and me, and starfish, it turns out, the daughter cells are directly over the parent cells. We call that radial cleavage. But in snails and uh, worms, earthworms and insects, the daughter cells at the eight cell stage are in the crotches between. So they twist a little bit. They're in the crotches um, above the parent cells. And we call that spiral cleavage. And Ooh. for snails, depending on whether it rotates this way or this way, that determines the coiling direction. It, so so why is it 50-50? Well, because most of them coil one direction. So but the scientists why? have gone in there with micro manipulators and they've Twist it down the other way, and then the snail grows the other direction. Oh, that's fascinating. So it has something to do with um, the spindle fibers. So if you remember um, DNA or the chromosome, the chromosomes all line up along the center of the 
the cell, the cell that's dividing, and then the spindle fibers pull the chromosomes apart. And depending on the orientation of the spindle fibers, then it'll pull the cells and then they will spiral one way or the other way. And so for most snails, they will coil one direction. But sometimes you'll get a mutation or sometimes it's just a developmental accident and they coil the other direction. And that's how you get these left-handed snails. Oh, that's fascinating. Amy wants to know what's your favorite type of snail? And I've seen several others, including CM, ask this as well. What is your favorite snail? Well, I like, um, it's hard for me to pick a favorite land snail because I like all the land snails. Although I, I do like the ones that have, I'm going to call them teeth in their apertures. Um, they're not chewing teeth, but they're, they're these bumps. I don't have an example here, um, but there, there are some bumps. Do I have examples? Oh, here, here's one. No, this doesn't have a bump, but this is closely related to one that does have a bump. Or, so anyway, inside the aperture would be um, bumps that um, they're not chewing teeth, but they look like teeth, so we call them teeth. And um, of course, we don't know why they have those teeth, but the hypothesis is, the, the best hypothesis is probably that they're used for um, defense because the snail doesn't have any bones, so it can slide in and out past those teeth. But a predator like a beetle has a hard exoskeleton and it can't get in there um, because of the tooth. So little oh. snail, little snail, let me come in, knocked by the slime on my chinny chin chin. <laughs> we think that it's there for, um, to, to, for protection. But um, so those are my probably my favorite land snails. They're a whole bunch of different kinds. But when it comes to sea snails, I think my favorite ones are the wentil traps. The wentil traps. Wentil are, traps? So, yeah, wentil traps, or sometimes, well, the genus Epitonium, um, or the wentil trap is the common name. And they've got these beautiful ribs on the shell, and they're just so strikingly beautiful. Those do sound pretty. I'll have to look those up. The Hall Science kids would like to know if you could tell how old a snail is by the number of rings on the shell, like how many times it spirals around. Um, the short answer is no. Um, there are some snails. Well, so if you think about rings on trees, let's see, let's talk about this clam for a moment. Uh, so if you think about rings on trees, the, the dark lines on the tree ring are the winters when it gets cold and the tree grows a dark line. Um, giant clams don't, they, they don't grow where it's cold. They live in warm water. And so even though you can see some growth lines here, they don't signify years. I'm mm. not sure what they signify, but in fact, they'll lay down several growth lines um, per year. Um, in fact, the giant clams can grow a little over an inch a year. Oh, wow. um, and uh, yeah, I'm not going to get into how we, we discovered that. But anyway, so they, they do grow growth, um, growth lines. So most sea clams don't have um, annual growth lines. Um, but there are some freshwater clams and even freshwater snails that will grow growth lines. I don't have an example here. Actually, I do in a jar, but I don't think you'll be able to see it. But anyway, this is a this is a freshwater clam, and um, in freshwater, things do tend to get cold in the winter time. Like where I live, some of the rivers freeze. Yeah. Uh, so the clams do get a, a growth line. So you can count the growth lines in um, a freshwater clam or some freshwater snails. But then again, on land snails. Most of the time, it's not the cold that um, causes them to, to grow things. It's the dryness. So mm -hmm. a lot of times, so here you can see um, some sort of interruption of growth. That's probably not because of um, winter. It's probably because of dryness. And let's see if we can find another interruption of growth. Well, there might be a slight one here. Well, here's another slight one. So these, these might be dry seasons or something like that. By the way, this is the largest living land snail. Um, this is the giant African snail. They live in Africa. And uh, here's, here's a model that I brought so you can see what the animal might have looked like when it was alive. Oh, wow. They Those are neat. Um, these, uh, these actually make, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but they make nice pets, but they're illegal in the U.S. because oh. they also make serious pests. <laughs> they eat up our food. They're competing with us for food. Um, 
they actually got into Florida a couple of years ago and uh, they just, uh, it, they ended up killing over a hundred thousand snails um, to try and wipe them out. And they were successful. They actually had, they trained dogs to sniff out this particular species of snail um, to help them eradicate those. But they are, they are really serious pests. So please don't get a giant African snail for a pet. But if you live outside the U.S., then yeah, go for it. You can have them in England. You can have them in Canada. Um, and they do. They make very nice pets because they're they're not shy. They grow really well. They reproduce well. Um, but don't let them outside if you're done with them, right? Oh, that's very good advice. Yes. Yes. So if you're, oh. if you're tired of it, give it to somebody else who will appreciate it. Or I'm, gonna say, I'm afraid you're going to have to kill it. And um, Nancy wants to know if snails can ever slide outside of their shells. Well, like I said earlier, the snail is actually attached to its shell, so it can never come all the way out. And I mean, it can't leave the shell behind, but it can emerge from its shell. Um, but you know, it's still got some parts of it is still up inside the shell, and it's still attached. And then we have several questions about: Can you tell the difference between a girl snail and a boy snail, or are snails hermaphrodites, or? I, does it does the answer is the answer just it depends on the species? It depends on the species. So the answer is both. Um, so uh, most land snails are hermaphrodites, so they're male and female at the same time. Um, when it's and and so <clears throat> so remember we were talking about the anus comes around to the front. Um, that also brings the genital opening and some sense organs and the gills. It brings a bunch of things around to the front. Um, and then some snail, some land snails will detort a little bit. So, so the anus, it's not shown here, but the anus, I guess it would be closer to here. The anus is gonna be on the side of the head. Um, actually the genital opening on this snail would probably be around here. And, um, and then the gill, well, this has lost its gills, but um, the gills would have been inside the shell. So when it's time to mate, the genital opening is on the right side of the head. So they're gonna mate with the right sides of their heads together like this and uh, earthworms do that too so they make right sides of their heads together and um, since they're hermaphrodites they're male and female sometimes both of them will pass sperm to the other snail so both of them become pregnant or gravid is probably the right word um, or other times one of them will play male and one will play female and the sperm will just go one direction so in theory, snails... if you had... oh sorry go ahead go ahead I was just going to say, gonna... other snails that have separate sexes, then there's one male and one female. But the hermaphrodites have the advantage that sometimes it just takes one to start a whole new colony. That's right. And some snails, like the New Zealand mud snail, can clone themselves, right? <laughs> yes, that is a serious pest. And, uh, right, they can self, well, let's see. So they're self-fertilizing. They have, they actually have ovaries and testes. So they're doing self-fertilization, I believe. But there are some snails um, around where I live called Campoloma. Um, that's a freshwater snail and they have no males. There's no testes at all. So they are doing parthenogenesis, it's called, where they produce eggs that don't need to be fertilized and then they can just grow up and uh, become just like, their, just like their parents. That's amazing. There's so much diversity in the snail the snail group, it's incredible. Um, one last little question, CM asks, how long do snail lives? And I saw a couple other people ask, what's the oldest snail that we know of? Do you know? Um, well, yeah, are you asking about longest lived or do you mean- Yeah, longest living the one, snail. The one that was living longest ago. The longest living snail, I don't really know. Or how about average lifespan? The snails that you've studied, do they tend to live just a couple years or do they live a couple decades? Well, right. So I'm much more familiar with landscapes. Well, first, let me say for sea snails, there are some that definitely live up into their 20s and 30s, probably even longer. And maybe some of the deep sea ones live even longer than that, but I don't really know. But for land snails, um, right, they can. Um, I'm more familiar with them. I have seen some get up into their early teens. Um, but most of them, um, well, actually some of them live maybe even less than a year, but, you know, on the order of a year, some of the really tiny ones, but um, most of the larger ones, they'll probably become adult in their second year, and then they can live for another 
three years, maybe so. Four or five years is probably an old snail. And then last question that we'll have before we finish up. Um, so there's some disappointment in the chat that great Africa, that great African land snail is not a pet you can have, but you could go out and collect your own herbivorous snail and keep it as a pet, right? Do you have any oh. recommendations for having either a pet for just a short term or even a long term snail pet? Um, so first, let me say that the federal government, be because snails can be such serious pests, the federal government regulates the movement of snails across state lines. So um, if you're going to have a snail for a pet, I would say collect it in your state and then keep it in your state. And then the feds won't have anything to say about you. Good um, advice. There is a particularly beautiful snail called Sapia nemoralis, sometimes called the grove snail. And so um, if you're familiar with iNaturalist or um, what's another one? Or, yeah, iNaturalist is probably probably the best. Um, if you get on iNaturalist, you can ask for where do the uh, grove snails live and maybe find a place near you, hopefully in your state, and you can go and collect some of them. They're not actually native to North America, but they have been naturalized and they're not causing problems. So the feds are not um, concerned about those. Or you can go out and find um, a snail, any other snail that lives in your in your woods, a native one. Um, there also are slugs, so if you don't mind a slug, you can uh, raise those as well. They make nice pets, but they they really muck up their cages pretty fast with all their slugs. <laughs> I said that was the last question, but I have to ask one more. Why do snails make slime? Do we know why snails make slime? Well, they use slime for a whole bunch of reasons. I mean, you make slime, your nose mucus is actually the same thing that the snails are making. <clears throat> so you use it. You use your slime for, for good reasons. And snails use it for a lot of different reasons. Um, the, the, the obvious one is that they use it for crawling. So underneath their chin, underneath their chin, they make a, a really sticky slime. And then they, so they're laying down a road. And then underneath the bottom of their foot, they're making a really slippery slime. So they make a road to stick them. And then they make a slippery slime to slide across it. Um, so, so they can crawl up ceilings, they, up walls, they can crawl on ceilings. Uh, because they've got this good slime road that they're making. They're also using um, slime to help uh, prevent evaporation. So the slime will help to slow down how quickly the water evaporates and lots and lots of other reasons. Oh, that is neat. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Tim. This was wonderful. And I hope if you're watching, I hope this sparked some good questions for you in areas you can continue to research because gastropods are amazing animals. And I, I loved exploring and finding snails and collecting them when I was a kid. And I even kept a couple from my backyard. I would keep them for a week or so in a jar and feed them. And then as soon as I got worried that maybe they weren't eating enough, I'd let them go again. <laughs> and it was really a fun summer project. Well, this has been great. Thank you very much for having me. Yes, thank you. Let's go ahead and we'll just end with a wave. We hope that you have a great start to your summer. Work hard, grow smart, and we'll see you in the next video.